on my lesson today. I want to just run through your corrections for exercise 1A and 1B. Okay, so the submit your homework to the front. Yes. Okay. See, I all begin is a habit already, ah. Uh. Okay. I want it by today inside my locker number twenty-seven. Containing the elements 
containing sorry containing the integers from one to five inclusive. Okay, so this is the uh, this is what we call describing in words. number two for question seven so you're not answering the question at all and then the same mistake is made again in your exercise 1b okay so when it comes to question eight this is question 7c what the answer should be okay i also noticed that you are very uh, lacking in mathematical terms you tell me things like it contains the number that can be cube rooted number one cube rooted is not a verb there is no such word okay you can take a cube root, take a square root, but you cannot cube rooted something. Okay, that's a very uh, colloquial, all right, very Singlish kind of way of saying it. All right, so there's no such word. Okay, then um, the word okay to be used is saying that it is a set of all perfect cubes. Okay, so the term is actually perfect cube. So some of you actually say they are integers that can be cubed, or you all just try to. Try to force in some words and throw in some words that you all know. Okay? And I find that this is a result of you all not being able to express, okay, articulate the mathematical terms. Okay, when you don't practice speaking, okay, this is the result of it. Alright? So we say that O is the set of all positive perfect cubes. Okay, why am I emphasizing on positive? Because there can exist negative perfect cubes. For example, negative 1 to the power of 3. Negative 1 to the power of 3 is a negative 1. Okay, and that is a perfect cube still. Alright, so emphasizing on positive perfect cubes. Okay. Then I also notice some of you make the attempts, alright? So maybe describe in words, okay, and by using it in set notation. So I still read it, okay. So some of you tell me O is the set of all positive integers that are perfect cubes, okay. So you tell me that they are integers. Number one, perfect cubes itself are surely integers already. So there's no need to actually express that they are going to be integers, okay. So it becomes a redundant part to say integers. Uh. Alright, although technically, even if you write something excess like that, you will not be penalized. Unless there is a contradiction. Okay, unless there is a contradiction, then you'll be penalized. Alright, so there's no need to say that it is an uh, uh, integer. And some of you think that O itself is an answer. Or O is, uh, what other things? O is a number. Okay, you tell me O has the answers or O has the number of uh, numbers and all that. O itself is a set. Okay, it is not a number. It is not an element. Right. So use the correct terms in describing. Okay. Then in part D, P itself is the set of all multiples of five. Okay. Because in the question there is dot dot dot. Okay, so that means that it goes negative infinitely and positive infinitely. And you notice there's a pattern in the question, okay, uh, whereby they are all multiples of five itself. So likewise, you no need to say that they are integers because multiples itself they are surely integers. Likewise, okay, when it comes to factors, factors are also integers. Okay, so that's why there's no need to actually uh, emphasize on it. Okay. Then uh, for question eight, part two. Question actually says, uh, Q and R empty sets use the notation, okay, the empty set notation five to describe Q and R. So to describe is actually just Q equals to empty set. R not equals to MP set. That's all. Okay. Next. Exercise 1B. When it comes to 
question 4 part 2 and question 7 part 2. Okay, when talking about proper subsets, explaining proper subsets. Okay, so in both of these questions, they ask to explain why they are proper subsets. You just had to okay say that all elements are taking part four, part two, etc. Four part two as an example. You can say all elements of B are in A. Okay. Then some of you forget to continue, missing the point that B cannot be equals to A. Okay. Only when they are not going to be equal, then they can be proper subset. Otherwise, if you miss out on this part, there is a chance that they are going to be subsets. Okay? Next, for question 5. Okay, I am surprised that some of you, I think, either misread the question. Okay, I'm not sure what's happening. Okay? Question 5 on page 13 of your textbook. They define the universal set and the set C. Okay. When the question asks to list the elements, uh, some of you are confused either by this definition of C itself. You maybe never catch the word not. So your listing of elements in the set C is wrong. Otherwise, okay, you thought that 1 is a prime number. Okay? So in the universal set zero between 0 and 10, it did not say that it's inclusive, so the universal set should have 1, 2, all the way to 9, 6, 7, 8. And then the set C, not a prime number. 1 is not a prime number. 4 is not. 6 and 8 and 9, they are not prime numbers. Okay? Then, incorrectly listing the elements here cause you to also incorrectly list for the complement set, which is 2, 3, 5, 7. Okay? So some of you included 1 inside it as well. Right, I hope that that is just a careless mistake but sometimes when it comes to such questions you can't really afford such careless mistakes also. Okay? Then in part 2, describing the set C prime in words okay, you can just say that C prime is the set containing all prime numbers. You did not have to tell me that they are containing all prime numbers from 0 to 10 because it is already bounded by a universal set. So there is a universal set being described already. Okay, So no need to actually further elaborate on that. Alright? Then... Mm, okay, then question 7, I think, uh, not much of an issue. Just that maybe when it comes to listing of the elements, some of you list it wrongly. But I think you will be able to identify it on your own. 9C, okay, uh, do keep in mind that uh, empty set is also a proper subset. Okay, question 9C, I noticed that some of you have poor presentation as well. You will tell me that, erase this, yeah. It will tell me that M is equals to the empty set 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 3, 5, and 4, 5. Take note that M itself in the question is defined to be this. These are not M. These are proper subsets of M. Okay? So if you really want to be very clear, you can say the proper subsets of M are 
then you list it all out. Okay, I notice also some of you don't put commas in between. You can put commas in between the, prop, uh, the proper subsets. Okay, any questions? Alright, so do keep in mind about all these points that I made. Okay? So you can do your corrections, then after you're done with your corrections, just file it directly inside your file. Okay, our Emacs file is supposed to be orange, right? So please file it in. Okay, if you have not yet gotten the file, please go and get the file. There will be a file check, okay? Uh, I will collect your files after the WA. Okay, so file check after WA. I call, I can bring up my phone. No, I didn't. Okay, so 16, this one is your WA date. I'll just collect your file here. E best of orange. Okay, I will be passing you the content page on the next lesson. Probability of A or B happening, 
it is equivalent to probability of A plus probability of B. Okay, so mutually exclusive means cannot happen at the same time. So in this case, when it comes to a national championship, surely they can't, there can't be two teams winning together. Okay? We are ignoring the fact that there is a possibility of ties and all that in a real life situation. Okay? Let's just assume that there will only be one person winning. Okay? So we are ignoring that kind of context. So in this case, therefore, all the, uh, all the events over here, they are all mutually exclusive. So when it comes to the probability of P or Q winning, right, the answer will then be probability of P winning, it's right, yeah, probability of P, P winning, plus the probability of T, Q winning, since they are mutually exclusive events. So we can take 1 over 5 plus 1 over 6, and we get 11 over 30. Then in part 2, what would the probability be if I want Q or R or S winning? How do we go about calculating that? I know you feel okay. Yes, Joseph? You are saying? 1 over 6 plus 1 over 7 plus 1 over 8. Yep. So we just add up the three probabilities since they are all mutually exclusive events and we get 73 over 168. I want us to keep in mind that okay, whenever we do probability questions, please, okay, Doubt your answer if your answer ends up being more than one. Alright? You must 100% question your answer if it ends up being like one whole and seven over ten. Okay? Because when it comes to probability, confirm can never be more than one. Likewise, the confirm can never be uh, negative. Okay? So if you get that kind of result, then you must go and check your answer side there again. Alright? Part 3, we want the probability that none of these teams win. So how do you think we can go about finding it? Bernice? Okay, so we take the 1 minus away the probability of any of these teams winning. Okay, so we take 1 minus probability of P or Q or R or S winning. So that will be 307 over 840. Okay. So actually this question did not specifically say that PQR and S are the only teams here. So there are other teams actually. So that's why there's that probability that uh, none of them are winning. Okay. And if you have added up all the probabilities given for them winning, they are not going to be equals to 1. Okay. Yourself. I also don't want to delve into the whole how it works kind of thing. 
Okay, so uh, let me just introduce some things first. Okay, in chapter 2.2, we look at how the tree diagram can actually be drawn. So if you were to consider a bag containing one red and one blue ball, okay, and we draw from the bag twice with replacement. Okay. How this tree diagram would probably look like is that we will look at the first draw where there is either taking a blue ball or a red ball. Then because we say that there is replacement, so that means even if you have taken out one red ball at the start, you will put it back for you to do the second draw. So there still exists a blue ball and a red ball when you do your second draw. Okay, so your tree diagram will look like this. Second draw. Okay. So this is a very simple kind of tree diagram. But what if we level up the context itself? Meaning to say, what if I have three blue balls and two red balls? Then will the tree diagram look complicated? Surely it will, right? Okay. So three blue and two red with replacement. Okay. So that means that I'm looking at three blue balls. So let's have B1, P2, B2 and B3. Two red balls, so that means R1 and R2. Okay. Then when I draw my tree diagram, okay, I need to consider which blue one am I taking or which red one am I taking. So My tree diagram would probably look something like that. Furthermore, because I'm going to do with replacement, that means in my second draw, if I had picked the first blue ball and I replace it, then I will have a lot of branching out, okay, when I, uh, when I do my second turn. And this will be a very complicated tree diagram to actually draw. Why is it that we need to consider okay, that the balls are actually distinct? Because we need to consider the probability. Because there exists that one more ball, alright, it will give us one more set of options, possibilities that we can actually uh, take out. So this tree diagram being very complicated to draw, we have a more simplified version. Right? And the more simplified version is that we just recognize that the balls that exist is either blue or red. Okay? we will write the probability of having to draw that blue ball on the branch of the tree diagram itself. So because there are three blue ones, out of a total of five balls, the probability of drawing a blue one will be three over five. Okay? And the probability of drawing a red one will be two over five. So instead of splitting up okay, the blue and the red, and then having a very large tree diagram because if I had to give you 10 blue and then after 7 red your tree diagram will take forever and worst still is one mark only okay so that's not going to uh, be very mark efficient and time efficient so we will collect everything and write the probability on the uh, branches itself okay when you write it uh, we can accept it if you do it in a non-simplified fraction right? because sometimes it's just about counting Right? But it will be a good practice if I simplify the fraction. Okay? You don't need to put in brackets. Right? Uh, although sometimes in the exam, they may put in the brackets to signify that you know, that's the blank that they want you to fill in. So it depends on how the question actually uh, wants you to actually go about doing. So this is the first draw. Then when we talk about the second draw, we have the blue and the red as well. 
And in this situation, because there is a uh, with replacement, that means the number of balls that still exist in the second draw is still 5. Okay, so it is all out of 5. Okay, and because even if I chose the first one to be a blue ball, I'm going to replace it. So in the second time that I draw, there will still be 3 blue balls. So I have 3 over 5, and then 2 over 5 over here. So we see that the probabilities actually remain the same even in the second draw. Alright? So, how do we actually use such a tree diagram then to actually solve our question? If I want to talk about find probability of choosing one blue and one red. Okay. How we will go about it is that along the branch itself, we multiply the probabilities. Okay. If it's separate branches, then I will add the probabilities. Meaning to say, if I'm talking about probability of choosing one blue and one red, that means I can take blue first, then red, or red first, then blue. Agree? So blue first, then red will be 3 over 5 times 2 over 5. Okay? So this is blue first, then red. Then we also have the case where red first, then blue. So I will have to plus 2 over 5 times 3 over 5. Okay? So along the branch, we multiply. Separate branches, we plus. Okay? We add up the probabilities together. Right? And then in this case, I will have my 6 over 25 plus 6 over 25. So I will have 12 over 25. Okay? Minus 3 over 5 times 3 over 5. Yeah, 
that will be 1 minus 6 over 25. We also can get, can I get 16? Oh, sorry, that's right. It's 16, right? So we still get 16 over 25. Oh, sorry, 9, no wonder. Okay? So we still get the same answer. Right? So basically, whenever we need to use a tree diagram to solve a question, okay, within that same branch, we multiply. Even if it's separate like that, okay, we will add up the combination separately. Okay, so that is how we make use of tree diagrams to actually solve a question. Right? Now, when it comes to independent events, what is an independent event? Independent means that um, the two events, first draw and second draw, they don't affect one another. Meaning to say, in this case, when we say that there is replacement, okay, our probabilities here for blue and red, they don't change because I put back the ball. Right, and that is what we call independent events. Now, what if I don't put back the ball? Okay, if I don't put back the ball, then the probability will change. Okay, so now if I say without replacement. So I will have first draw blue and red. So first draw I will have 3 over 5 for blue and 2 over 5 for red. Because I'm not going to replace the ball. If I take one blue out already, how many balls will there be left inside the bag? Four, right? So it should be over four, over four. numerators okay will be different now I take out a blue ball how many blue balls will there be left inside the bag I'll be left two right so it will be two over four so in a tree diagram we will accept if you don't simplify this answer okay you can go and simplify equals to half that's also fine okay but it is actually easier for us to see if you don't simplify I'll explain in a moment then for number of red balls, because I took out one blue only, number of red still remains the same, 2 over 4. Okay? So similarly, if I first took out a red one, number of blue ones remain the same, 3 quarter. Number of red ones will be reduced to 1. So probability is 1 quarter. Okay? Now, why do I say don't simplify? How is it easier for us? Okay, notice that whenever I look within that set itself, the probabilities add up to 1. Over here, it adds up to 1. Over here, adds up to 1. It will always add up to 1. So like this, add up to 1, 1 whole, 1 whole. Okay, it should never be a case whereby they add up to be non-whole, non-one whole. Non Okay, if it adds up to become not one whole, that means the way you count is incorrect already. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So if we're talking about this without replacement case, and I try to answer my question, then my probabilities will be different already. Okay. So um, I'll just erase this up. Okay, so if I want to answer question 1, find the probability of choosing one blue and one red. Along that branch, I multiply, separate branch, I add. Okay, so probability choosing one blue and one red. What do you think it's going to be? So what would it be? Getting one blue and one red. Combinations, second and third. So we got blue, red, and 
and red blue, right? So blue red, what will I do with the power decrease? Sorry? Times. So I should write 3 over 5 times 2 over 4 plus 2 over 5 times 3 over 4. Yes. Okay, and we see that this will give us 6 over 20 plus 6 over 20. I will get 12 over 20. That is divided by 4, 3, or 3 over 5. Okay, so notice that the probability changes, right, when there is without replacement. It is different. Okay. And then if I were to look at question 2, erase this right here. to be the answer if I want to find the probability of at least one ring. Kelly, what will you get? 1 minus 3 over 5 times 2 over 4. Okay, 3 over 5 times 2 over 4. That is using the approach of taking 1 minus or uh, having to have all the balls being blue. Okay, so that will be 1 minus 6 over 20. 14 over 20 divided by 2. So 7 over 10. So answer also different when it comes to uh, without replacement. Okay. So when we call it without replacement, right, that is a dependent event because it depends on one another. With replacement is what we call independent event. Okay. They are actually um, separate from one another. They don't read the probabilities don't affect one another. Okay. But do take note that independent events and also mutually exclusive events are different. Okay? So for example, just like I gave an example whereby if Miss Pang is coming to class to teach, okay, that's one event. And then you're sleeping in class is a separate event. Okay? They are mutually exclusive. Because when I come into class, you cannot be sleeping in class. Alright? But then they are actually dependent on one another. Because whether I come into class or not, it will affect whether you're sleeping in my class or not. You understand? They are not independent because we affect one another. You understand? Okay, so independent events will be things like pre replacement or without replacement. Okay? Oh, I don't do so long already. Okay, so um, let's look at our work example. Hey, oh, sorry, practice now nine. Okay? Can I do practice now nine? Yes, I can. of practice now 9 we have a company that has 18 men 12 women that company has two departments one is an admin department the other one is tech department so it says that the tech department there are 12 men 4 women that will tell us that in the admin department there should be 6 men and then 8 women okay 
So there is one chairman and one chairwoman to be selected from 18 men and 12 women. Okay, obviously we take it for granted that the chairwoman will be selected from the women, cannot be selected from the men. Oh, is that right? Okay, then the chairman by right should be selected from the men, not from the women. Although in our class, whenever you select chair, but chairman, okay, we select our whole class. Okay, that's just a general term, right? So, part I, we want to find the probability that the chairman and chairwoman are from the tech department. Okay? So, how do we solve this question? Finding the probability of getting a chairman from the tech department, there are 12 men from the tech department out of a total of 18 men. So we take 12 men out of 18 and we multiply okay, with the number of women from the tech department for out of a total of 12 women. And that will give us 2 over 9. Okay. Why we can do this is that if I want to illustrate this context into a tree diagram, okay, selecting a chairman and selecting a chairwoman are actually independent events. If you select a chairman already, okay, it doesn't affect what's the probability going to be like from selecting a chairwoman. Agree? Okay, so if I want to really illustrate it into a tree diagram, it doesn't matter who comes first, be it chairman come first or chairwoman come first. So it's either admin or tech. And admin or tech. Admin and tech. So if we're talking about the men, we are selecting from the men. So out of a total of 18 men. Admin department has 6 men, tech has 12. For women, we are selecting out of the total number of women. So it is all out of 12. Admin will be uh, 8 women and tag will be 4 women. So what this question is asking is about chairman and chairwoman from tech department. That means I am actually looking at this branch over here. That's why I take 12 over 18 times 4 over 12. Okay? So, it can be helpful to actually draw a tree diagram to understand how to solve this question. Although this question didn't actually ask. Right? So, what I also want to draw in conclusion is that previously when we see the word all, okay, we add up the probabilities, the separate probabilities, right? Okay? In this case, when we see the word and, right, what I can do is to multiply. Okay, multiply what? Multiply the probability of chairman from that department and chairwoman from that department. Okay, but I just want to really caution you that we cannot always conclude that when we see all, it means plus and means times. Because there is a condition to it that this must be mutually exclusive events and this must be independent events. Okay? So, because of class, right? Okay, these two sets, tech and admin, tech and tech, they are actually mutually exclusive events. They don't affect one another. Right? That's why we can do this any kind of thing. But I don't want to really to get you to dwell on to this whole theory behind it. Okay? As long as you get the idea that along the branch, multiply separate branch at you'll be fine, okay? And also check your answer. There should never be more than one. If it's more than one, then something is not right in the probabilities that you write in your tree diagram, okay? But there is that um, general assumption that this could work, okay? I think I'll just end here today, okay? So that you go back and sync the concepts, sync the idea. Next
lesson, I'll wrap this up.